A good way to think about Kendrick Lamar's Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers is as a play in two acts, a series of musical therapy sessions where he shares with us his process of healing through reflection, letting go of the past, to focus on self-improvement and changing in the present. I was born in February 24th, he sets out to break a generational curse by offering this new perspective on healing for the rest of us. An example inspired by German spiritual teacher Eckhart Tolle, who's featured at multiple points in the album, guiding Kendrick through his process. Tolle is most known for The Power of Now, which prioritizes living in the present over letting the traumas of the past define you, and also for his concept of the pain body, a second consciousness that's created out of trauma and will cause you to seek out negativity, stay in abusive and toxic relationships, and hurt the people around you the way that you were hurt all because they feed into the consciousness that, ever since that first experience, has found comfort in that trauma. And at some level, you recognize that most of your suffering is self-created. It needs to periodically feed on more unhappiness. The lesson that breaks this cycle, this curse, is that you can't move forward with your own growth without acknowledging and pinpointing the source of your flaws from your trauma and childhood experiences, something central to the practice of therapy. Equally central to this album and this process is to stop judging others. They judge you, they judge Christ. God speak for women's rights. They judge Realizing that you don't know what trauma someone else has been through that has made them act the way they do. I know the secrets, every other rapper sexually abused. That's it, man. That's the fuck. I got when I was 11, twist. I loved it. I see them daily, burying their pain and chains and tattoos. So listen. You get a lot of tattoos on all over your body. Is mm -hmm. that is that artwork? Is that and an, do you have a kind of master plan? Okay, I want to look like that, or is it just does it happen spontaneously? So that you before can... you start to pass judgment, know how we move, learn how we cope. A society doesn't heal from everyone calling others out. It heals from everyone calling themselves out. Taking that individual journey towards becoming a better person to themselves and the people around them. Kendrick doesn't get there right away though. He uses this album to take us through his entire healing process by starting from the very beginning before he accepted therapy and when he was still engulfed in his ego and resistant to acknowledging his own flaws, his Mr. Morale era. On the first half of this project, he's still thinking in terms of duality, a separation between himself and the steppers around him, that wickedness or weakness from Dan, that you versus I from To Pimp a Butterfly. He starts off in his usual preacher mode, commenting on general societal flaws like he's done in the past, how we'd expect the Kendrick of To Pimp a Butterfly to act in therapy for the first time. In each of these songs, he describes the struggles of the big steppers, the masses of people who struggle with their flaws and sins but step in alignment with some sort of leader figure, some Mr. Morale, so they're able to validate some moral superiority and see their steps as bigger than the steps of others. People identify with belief systems and follow the paths of leaders so they can feel like they're doing something better than anyone who doesn't follow them. Next time you give the album a listen, keep in mind that it's all supposed to be set up like a play. Pay attention to the beats, the way they build up, taper out, follow unusual patterns, resemble steps, and are even sometimes bookended by the sound of actual steps. We're supposed to be imagining Kendrick's center stage, reckoning with his disillusionment from savior status, his realization that he can't be anyone's savior if he's this deeply flawed, while surrounded by these steppers who still look up to him and validate his every word. They make it difficult to let go of his ego and really move on. It's this battle that he faces as this moral public figure. It's hard to acknowledge and grow out of your flaws when everyone around you is praising you and looking to you as an example, waiting for your guidance on how to fix their own flaws. This separation and moral high ground from his surroundings is the natural evolution of him being the good kid in a mad city. From the beginning, his music has painted him as a leader and savior, and he grapples with the truth of that position on this project. 
He makes the realization that he's right there with the Big Steppers and opens up about his own issues by the time we get to the first song on the second half of the album, Count Me Out. This is where he reaches a breakthrough in his therapy. His Mr. Morale persona is brought down to reality and it's followed by some of his most personal and honest confessions ever on the album's second half. The structure of the first half being about society's problems and the second being more specific to Kendrick's is circular, and the album is structured that way too. Thematically, each song corresponds to a counterpart on the other disc, but in reverse order. And along this theatrical journey, we get entire monologues from Baby Keem and Kodak Black, a chorus that interrupts the action at key points to add meaning and omniscient perspective, like in an ancient Greek epic. And the song We Cry Together, a six minute dialogue of a toxic relationship that plays out like a movie scene, but still follows traditional rap structure. Clearly, there's a lot to unpack, so if I miss anything, let me know down below. I read every comment and I learn so much from hearing all your perspectives every time. But I've kept y'all waiting long enough. Let's see how this all plays out track by track. 1,855 days. We start out with Kendrick detailing the ways he's dealt with his issues before therapy in the song United in Grief. I've been going through something. The song's title implies he abandoned duality. He gets some sort of unity in shared grief. But what we actually get on the track is a more egotistical Kendrick. I grieve different. Kendrick before therapy, still reveling in the perks of fame and wealth. The new Mercedes were black, G-wagon away from, it was all for rap. When the steps, the beat in the background speeds up, he gets energized by the compliance of his big steppers, and he spends the song convincing us that his grief and way of dealing with it is superior to others. He drowns his problems in material solutions, spending and fucking the pain away. And comments on how his cousin Baby Keem has dealt with his issues in the same way ever since achieving fame. I watched Keem by four cars in four months. It's in the family to deal with their trauma like this. You know the family dynamics on repeat. The overarching moral voice of the album comes back to that unity in the end. Kendrick seems to be humbled and realizes that everyone grieves different. Everyone's grief is unique and his status doesn't make him any more special. It can be processed in the ways that many others process it, through spiritual reflection and therapy. The next step of his healing process is breaking down the barriers between himself in a higher social and economic status and others. Before he gets to that point, he has to take off the masks on his true self that he's described putting on in the intro track. The luxury, don't take off the doje, take off the broken bag. The moral superiority, take off the fake deep, take off the fake woke, take off the I'm broke, I can't. The lies, take off the unsure, take off the decisions I had. And he tells us to do the same. When all those masks are taken off, he could accept that despite the flashy exterior. On the inside, he's ugly as fuck. But what's important to know is that he hasn't accepted that all of this is about himself yet. The word in the panic, the women is stranded, the men on the run. The it's still in the preachy tone of his Mr. Morale persona. He still calls out issues in the structure of society and he's calling out the lack of authenticity in others take off from fabricate streams and the microwave memes it's a real world outside but here's where it starts to get a lot clearer that it's more and more a projection of his own issues Who you they carry up, carry up us? the song's title references n95 mass and the song makes multiple references to the covid19 pandemic you're back outside, but they still lie. Kendrick's point here is that despite the masks being taken off at the end of the pandemic, there are still a lot of masks to the truth that exist in our day to day. So by track three, he's beginning to take off all these barriers to real self-reflection, and he begins to open up a little bit more about his mistakes, like his sex addiction and infidelity to his wife, Whitney. Whitney asked, did I have a problem? I said I might be racist. Ancestors watching me fuck was like retaliation. He's still not fully grown out of that moral superiority, or at least is not yet at the point where he can focus on taking accountability. He blames his issues on historical context. And because he had locked up Uncle Perry, she paid her daddy's sins. And lumps up. 
8 billion people on earth and with him as silent, silent murderers. murderers for being quick to come after others for their mistakes. Let's walk in zombies trying to scratch that itch. Family is central to this song. He admits that even as this messiah he embodies, the man of God, he would kill for his daughter. Life as a protector, father, I kill for. An idea that's directly mirrored in the album art, where he wears Jesus' crown of thorns, yet keeps a gun tucked in his waist. This is that ongoing tension between this ideal of morality and the reality of the dangers of the world. The dire circumstances, the character flaws, the priorities that make that ideal unreachable. Kendrick is poised as this messiah for all the big steppers but has more immediate people to save and protect, like himself and his family. At the same time, he comments on cancel culture in the sense that it's not empathetic enough to these circumstances. Niggas kill freedom of speech, everyone sensitive. Nobody is at that moral ideal, but everyone is still so quick to kill or cancel someone who makes a mistake. I'm a killer, he's a killer, she's a killer, bitch. Putting their livelihoods and families in jeopardy. This turns us into murderers if we're quick to cancel, and silent murderers if we're complicit in this culture. But this isn't the black and white fuck cancel culture statement you might think it is. Here Kendrick is still in his Mr. Morale voice, and while he's admitting to his sex addiction, ask Whitney about my lust addiction, he doesn't take accountability for it, and instead brands anyone who judges him as a murderer. The noble person that goes to work and pray like they post up, making everyone just as bad as him. Slaughter people too, your murder's just a bit slower. Although there's truth and intention to his comments on cancel culture, I think this construction of the song getting personal, but not personal enough for Kendrick to actually acknowledge his fault carries nuance that seems to say that at this point in the process, Kendrick's not quite ready to own up to his mistakes yet. At this point, he's still the preachy Kendrick who would rather blame them on the rest of society than take a closer look at himself. He starts to get there little by little though. This next song is a more personal, more honest view at the mistakes in his relationship. And it's directed at Whitney. So it's filled with regret and guilt about letting his past shape his actions I got some regrets. and hurting her the way he did. I still risk it all for a stranger. He's not giving up on his relationship in this song. I wanna see the family stronger. He wants to embrace the love that was there. But my past won't keep me from my best. Asking for another opportunity to do what's right and become his best self for her and for the family. Now that he's somewhat open to doing what he can to move forward, we hear the advice of his partner Whitney, who recommends that he sees a therapist. You really need some therapy. Real nigga need no therapy. Playing into the stigmatization of seeking help for mental health issues, claiming he's too real for therapy, but when she suggests that he reaches out to Eckhart Tolle, reach out to Eckhart. the real therapy session begins. With him opening up about the realities of how the conditions of his childhood and family life affected the person he is. I come from a generation of home invasions. He calls his life a plot. My life is a plot, twisted from directions that I can't see. Adding to the theatrical theme, and describes that plot as twisted from directions he can't see. Influenced in all these invisible ways by all these things from the past, and he's never really broken down the connection of his trauma to his present issues the way Eckhart would, until embracing his teachings and therapy. He reflects on the strict, tough love upbringing that his father put him through, the discipline and pressure to work hard that he instilled him with to keep him out of the streets, but with an element of strength Cause if I cried about it, he surely tell me not to be weak coming from hiding one's emotion Hit my emotions, never express myself which explains the aversion to therapy in the first place. This way of seeing the world as cutthroat and everyone being out for themselves Protect yourself, trust nobody, only your mama knows it was true in their environment, but Kendrick places emphasis on how it damaged his relationships. This made relationships seem cloudy, never attached to none. Made it difficult to get attached to or trust others, making him way too competitive and focused on himself. Daddy issues kept me competitive. To understand why. Cause when Kanye got back with Drake, I was slightly confused. For example, Kanye and Drake would put their pride aside and settle their differences after dealing blows to each other's honor. Guess I'm not mature as I think. Got some healing to do. Kendrick was wired by his father and his circumstances to keep his heart closed off and keep his mind and tongue sharp to be able to survive. But he argues that weakened his soul. And your tongue has made a sword, but it may weaken your soul. His ability to feel love and compassion. The extreme of that occurs when people don't have fathers at all. My niggas ain't got no daddy. Grow up overcompensating. In Kendrick's eyes, they turn to gangs for that masculine example. No shit about being a man in disguise it as being gangster. Becoming even colder and more individualistic. 
centering identity around one's honor and pride so much that they would resort to killing others to protect it. Kendrick now sees value in acknowledging the impact of these circumstances I love my father for telling me to take off the gloves on how one acts. They can't stop us if we see the mistakes. Starting to realize that you can become unstoppable if you recognize the cycle and end it, ending the harm that that causes to the people around you. He highlights that the men that go through this project their trauma onto their partners. Till then, let's give the women a break. Grown men with daddy issues. And he pleads for us to give women a break from having to deal with how our trauma manifests in toxicity and abuse. A lot of people were confused or mad about Kodak's inclusion on this album, but when you look at it in the context of this play that Kendrick set up for us, it makes perfect sense. You're hearing from Kendrick for the entire performance, seeing his progress from being looked up to, to humbling himself enough to learn from others. Suddenly, you get this new character, center stage, giving a monologue. What Kodak really represents is a different kind of leader, a different kind of Mr. Morale that Kendrick can actually relate to. Think about trap music in general and the way that it glorifies these extreme levels of wealth, escaping the depths of poverty to become a rich superstar. It's a type of shit we glorify. Everybody gang gang. Trap artists aren't moral examples, but they're still looked up to and put on a pedestal for getting to where they've gotten in life. A bunch of lost souls in survival mode. They want no way for us unless we find our own. Just like Kendrick, Kodak is surrounded by yes men, fans, these big steppers trying to be like him and validating his lifestyle because he's achieved the standard of financial success. Just like Kendrick, Kodak is realizing that this validation and his ability to inspire doesn't make him a savior even if his lifestyle is what everyone thinks they want. The name of the interlude being called Rich is Perfect because the interlude examines what it really means to be rich. He essentially starts off saying that even with all the money he can want, he's still broke. He's rich in material, but not in spirit. Rich nigga get my dick sucked after the show. I ain't gonna lie, we were poor. His soul is just as lost as it was when he started. The flashy lifestyle was not what it seemed. His career and success story seems to glorify gangs, violence, and wealth, but has proved to be a trap to the big steppers who follow him. Those are people that you grew up with and I ain't chain game. They end up dead or in jail. I love that he references the fact that people will be confused at the pairing of him and Kendrick. What you doing with Kendrick? Man? What you doing with a legend? But in this play, they're different people playing the same role. This example and leader, too flawed to be followed. Rich nigga bankroll. Just a while ago, I used to wear the same. This is the song where Kendrick learns from Kodak's lesson pictures, put me in the loop. that being rich in wealth does not equal being rich in spirit and begins to act with the intention of making his spirit richer, abandoning his phone, Broke phone. fasting, Can't fuck with you no more. I'm fasting, and abstaining from sex. But this step of the process isn't without its own challenges. He still has to stand firm against criticism. Stop playing with me for a turn to a song. His cousin suing him. And my cousin tried to sue me like he got the privilege. And just maintaining the spiritual balance he's trying to introduce into his life. Trying to keep the balance, so stand strong. It takes strength and it's a constant process. And it doesn't all change right away. It's easy to be on the path of healing and relapse into old ways, but that shouldn't stop the journey. And that's exactly where this next song fits in. So many notes of flowers. I never lied, even back when I was broke. These other rappers act like CB4 shit. So if this album is a play, We Cry Together is the climax of this play's first act, that relapse into toxicity, a dialogue between a couple whose back and forth argument is mirrored in the dissonance and uneasy wobble back and forth of the piano, over which Kendrick and Taylor Page have their fight, partly inspired by poetic justice. Fuck you, nigga. Nah, fuck you, bitch. Nah, fuck you, nigga. This fight touches on all the aspects of a toxic relationship, but begins to clearly be about more than just this couple. Whitney is heard at the start saying, this is what the world sounds, this is like. What the world sounds like. These toxic dynamics reflect how traumatized people hurt each other, hurt people, hurt people, in all kinds of contexts. Both sides are traumatized, both sides are expressing the pain of their past by taking it out on another person through anger, and this is how a whole society functions when people don't end the cycle of toxicity by healing and let go of that individual pain body. The fight gets larger in scope by the second verse, and begins to reflect the struggle for power, control, and justice between men and women socially and culturally. You the reason we overlooked, underpaid, underbooked, understand. In entertainment, in politics, the Why they say it's a man's world, see you the reason for Trump. Throughout all aspects of life, 
You can see this song about your own relationship, about inequality in the workplace, even about Kendrick's relationship with rap as a genre, which gives double meaning to the cousin line. I'd rather fuck on your cousin. Bitch, you said you go fuck who? He disappeared from the game for so long that fans switched over to listening to his cousin instead. Kendrick uses this song to show that this toxicity begins on the domestic level, begins with individual relationships, but the sum of all these toxic individual relationships is what creates the larger social issues that plague culture. What's revealed at the end is that what both sides really want, what they naturally incline towards, is unity. Lay this pussy back on the couch. Doggy style, then you get on. But issues occur when you skip to that unity nah, you plan. without resolving the initial issues. They're clearly not done fighting, but have sex anyway. The fight is clearly just going to continue after. People don't want toxicity naturally, they just play along with it because they're feeding the cycles they've grown up with. They're feeding the pain body. They think it's the only way to live, they think because it was done to them it has to continue to others. What people really want is to grow and heal. So Whitney ends the song by urging us and urging Kendrick stop to stop tap dancing, dancing around the conversation. conversation. Stop stepping uneasily like the piano throughout the song. Step with purpose and consistently like the steps at the end of the song. Step straight to the point to achieve that healing and unity. Kendrick is in this therapy session talking about all these issues with society. Here Whitney's telling him to get to the point. We all feel like we have to play the game of life by rules that lead to cause harm to others to make ourselves feel better. When what truly brings us happiness is being more and more at peace with ourselves with the goal of bringing that peace to those who need healing around you. Purple Hearts closes out the first act with a plea to shut up and let the love happen. Shut the fuck up when you hear love talk. Cut the back and forth of that last song. Get straight to the point of what everyone really wants. That love, that unity. Embrace each other for our flaws and differences. Kendrick has optimism that, although it's muddled by that back and forth so often in life, love will win out and survive in the end and healing and unity is achievable. With this new optimism, Kendrick is finally able to stop tap dancing around the conversation, and so he finally reaches his therapeutic breakthrough at the beginning of the second act.